On today's episode, we're talking about Gerard John Schaefer Jr. He's an American murderer and suspected serial killer known as the killer cop, the hangman, or the butcher of Blind Creek, depending on how you know him. He was convicted of the murder and mutilation of two teenage girls in 1972 and is suspected of up to 26 other murders. We'll tell that story and we'll play the Wheel of Death with a calling guest. All that and more today on Two Murder Morons. This podcast includes adult language and graphic depictions of murders and murder scenes. This is a comedy-style true crime podcast. We do our best not to make fun of victims or victims' families. However, we do introduce comedy while telling graphic stories. If the mix of comedy and true crime is not your thing, this may not be the right podcast for you. Audience discretion is advised. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the show in this episode of Two Murder, Murder Morons. Morons. My name's Andy, and this here is my Mike. buddy Mike. Yep. Hey, how you guys doing? <laughs> hey, I'm Mike. Yeah, but guess what? What's that? I'm excited today. Why are you excited today? Because we're going to play the Wheel of Death. I know, dude. The Wheel of Death. We, we finally... Yeah, I mean, it's like, yes. I know, right? It's like time. See, and, and we're behind. They don't get it because we're behind. You know, yeah, we record yeah. this stuff ahead of time. So at this point in time, this is our fourth public episode, and we've done seven bonus episodes so far. Yeah. And we have been dying to have a Wheel of Death participant. Yes. And we finally have one. Yes. Cannot wait to play that. Exciting. Yeah. If, ready for it. Yeah. If I can get my audio skills. To get yeah. For and hopefully, hopefully they uh, actually call in. Oh, I'm we'll sure wait, we'll, 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 get we'll get a hold get of them. Okay. I'm sure we'll get a hold of them. All right. Um, uh, so today's story. Gerard Schaefer. Yes. Have you heard of this guy? The killer cop Mm-mm. out of Florida? Mm-mm. Well, and some other places, but the crimes are in Florida. Never heard of him? No, I really haven't. Oh, man. He's an interesting fellow. We're going to get into that story and more. But first, we have some business to attend to. Oh, we've got a new member. Oh, hence why we're getting Wheel of Death participants. That's right. Yep. Uh, so Justin Kaufman. Justin. Justin, thank you for being a Buy Me a Coffee yep, member. Thank you. Um, if you are interested in bonus content, including bonus episodes, consider becoming a Buy Me a Coffee member. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons to find out more. Yes. Yes. But thank you, Justin, very much for your support. Um, without people like you. Yep, much appreciated. We just wouldn't have any members. Yeah. We'd probably still do the show. We would. But, but it would it just would be, be us. nice to have. <laughs> Members. It'd be nice to have yeah. people watching. Yeah. Yeah. And supporting the show. Yes. Oh man. So should we dive right into the story here? Hey, we would hey. Always do. Always do. Yeah, better to get her done now. All right, look at this guy here. This All is right. well, he's a decent looking dude. Yeah. He's got kind of a creepy smile though. Well, but you know, still, you know, he's not he doesn't look like your typical psycho. He's kind of got the Ted Bundy thing. Like he could probably, yeah. if he's able, he could probably hit on women and pick up women and true, you know, he's kind of got that, that yeah. going for him. He looks like a normal everyday guy. Yeah. Unlike he kind of has like the Jack Nicholson Joker smile going on though. Yeah. He actually kind of does. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. He does. He's got that. Wow. Damn. That is deep. Yeah. Well, and now that we're talking about photographs uh, on radio, basically, it's probably a good time to bring up if you're listening to this right now, on any major podcast platform. This is also a video podcast. So yes. if you want to switch over to Spotify or YouTube, you can actually see what we're talking about here. And what we look like. And yeah, I get I get that it's kind of it's kind of rude, really. We do talk about a lot of pictures. True. I'm sure people that are listening are like, these what ass the hats are, are all talking about. What are they talking about? Oh, Jesus. But um, yeah, Spotify, YouTube, you can tune in. And likewise, if you're watching us right now and would rather listen, any of the uh, podcast platforms that we're going to show on your screen right now, you can Listen into the show. Yeah, make sure you uh, subscribe and like while you're on it. Yes, please. That definitely yes. helps us out. All right, Gerard Schaefer. He's born in Nina, Wisconsin, March 26, 1946. Okay. So he's he's about the age of my folks. He's a couple years older. But All right, yeah. He's the first of three children born to Gerard John Schaefer Sr. Uh, and Doris Marie Schaefer. Okay. Uh, his father was a traveling salesman, so we're already getting into the – absentee father type situation. Yeah, those guys, they traveled. Yeah. Back then, especially back then. Yeah. 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 So father's gone all the time. Yep. Uh, his mother was a housewife. Okay. Um, 
he was raised primarily in Nashville, Tennessee, and later in Hotlanta, Georgia, <laughs> where he Jesus. attended Mar- Marist, Marist, Marist. We'll get somebody that went there. Yeah, that somebody went gonna there knows what we're talking correct about. Correct us. Yeah. Marist Academy until his family permanent, re- permanently relocated to Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 1960. I don't know what kind of academy that was. Was that like a... Marist? I don't know. Well, Google it. As I'm telling the story, why don't you Google? It's M-A-R-I-S-T Academy. All right, All right well, let me do it. Let's and it's on. in Hot Lana. Marist? M-A-U-R? M-A-R-I-S-T. He's deep, deep into the Google. Schaefer later described his childhood as troubled and turbulent, largely due to the frequent family relocations, his father's alcoholism. So we got that going on. Got absentee dad when he is around, he's drunk. Yep, another alcoholic. Um, And his father's frequent verbal abuse of his wife and children. Although the elder Schaefer's occupation resulted in his being frequently absent from the household, he had a difficult relationship with his oldest son, who resented his frequent belittling, I'm not going to be able to talk today, Mike. I, I, yeah. Be rittering his frequent belittling of him and believed his father favored his sister over himself and his brother. By contrast, Schaefer was close to his mother, who was extremely protective of her children. Okay. So this is this is kind of, is this not how Richard Speck kind of started out? Kinda, like, yeah. The, yeah. the absentee, alcoholic, yeah, yeah. alcoholic well, father figure. And, well, no, because, well. And the close relationship to mom, like the mama's boy kind of thing. Yeah, but his, his original dad wasn't, a, wasn't an alcoholic. It was the second dad. That's true. It was the stepdad. Step dad. Yeah. This is his, this guy's actual but dad. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. Yeah. You yeah. got to go on the same line. Yeah. Do you find anything on the university? It's $22,000 a year. Whoa. That's college. Yeah. That's not high school. That's. That's college. Yeah. So he went to like a private. School. Well, he, that's university, right? Is that what I said? Oh, it, this is it. Well, what is oh, this? Oh, he attended uh, Mars Academy until his family in 1960. Well, if he's born in 46, yeah, he's only 14, 15, 16 when he's going there. So it's like yeah, a private. It's a private high school, like a private school. Somebody might know. There's somebody out there probably went to school here. So yeah, let us know. Drop a drop a comment or something. Probably like that guy is a moron. You can't even find him on Google. <laughs> yeah, he needs to go to a private academy <laughs> somewhere. Idiot. Yeah, Jesus. Oh. Too late. So as a child, Schaefer preferred outdoor activities. By his adolescence, he had developed an interest in nature. No. Oh. His primary interests as a teenager included collecting guns, hunting, and fishing, activities that he and his father occasionally pursued together when his father was at home. Okay. Although hardly a classic loner, classmates at St. Thomas Aquinas High School recall his not being part of any clique. That would be kind of a Catholic sign. That, I mean, it sounds like he's like Catholic. Probably. He frequently pursued his interests alone, leading his family and peers alike to view him as an outdoorsman. Okay. Who held aspirations to become a forest ranger. Oh, yeah. That's a good job. Yeah. Especially nowadays. Actually, that'd be a great job. Yeah. Uh, By his teenage years, Schaefer developed erotic fantasies of hunting women. Okay. Okay. Whom That's he, a whole other story. Well, I know. We just shifted. <sighs> Man, we went from uh, Smokey to the Bear to... <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we went from he wants to be a forest ranger to he wants to hunt yeah, women. Yeah, he wants to hunt women. Uh, these fantasies gradually evolved into his developing a penchant for sadomasochism and bondage. Yep. So he's into the tie me up, gag me kind of stuff. Yeah, so he wants to hunt them, tie them up, gag them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um. He also derived pleasure from inflicting pain upon himself. Occasionally, as he wore women's underwear until he achieved orgasm via autoerotic asphyxia. Now that's some that's some crazy stuff. That's some psych psych. Yeah, that's some. Uh, yeah. I, I've seen uh, some videos of some people that let that did that by themselves and let it go a little too far, and yep. they're found weeks later yep. hanging basically or they, their partner, or they yeah, and take it too far and yep. mm-hmm. end up in a lot of trouble. Yep. Typically, these sado, uh, sadomasochistic rituals involve Schaefer tying himself to a tree in rural locations. These fantasies would increase in terms of frequency and intensity with time, gradually dominating many of his waking hours. Could you imagine uh, be out in the woods with your kids and you're just out for a stroll and you come across this guy, this guy. Tied, tied to a tree? <laughs> hey. Just saying. People are into what they're into, man. I, I you get know? it, but, you know. Mm. Schaefer also becomes a peeping Tom in oh. his mid-teens, mm. 
uh, and is known to have developed the habit of cross-dressing. Okay. Although he dated in his high school years, several female classmates viewed him with disdain. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. I, I can see why. Yeah. Uh, one former classmate, Barbara Krolik, later recollected, quote, I can't remember him being friends with any of the guys. He was always on the outside looking in. As a matter of fact, the only thing I really remember is that I always had to tuck my shirt under my legs because Schaefer would practically stand on his head to look up a girl's skirt. So he's not even, he's not the creepy guy that every once in a while gets caught yeah. kind of with a mirror. It's pretty much well known he's the creeper and he right, just yeah, you out look at, open. You blow the bleachers. There he is. Right. And yeah. they know to look for him. Like they know he's probably yeah, there. Yeah. 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 Nuts. Mm. Uh, Schaefer, though, was considered a promising student by his teachers. Okay. Uh, his records reveal that uh, he was a member of the varsity football team during his sophomore and junior years. Okay. All and right. he is known to have been an excellent golfer. Okay. Uh, well, he's got some, you know, I mean, he had to have some guy friends out of that aspect of it. Well, yeah. And that's, I think that's why they were saying in this that, you know, he wasn't your typical, like complete loner. Yeah. He wasn't the oddball that never spoke, didn't do anything. I mean, he's involved in yeah, some activities. Yeah, he's doing something. Yeah. Uh, he graduates from St. Thomas. Am I saying, is that a Aquinas? Aquinas? Aquinas, yeah. Aquinas. Aquinas. I mean, they say however. Okay. Um, anyway, he graduates from there in June 1964 and briefly worked as a fishing guide in the Everglades. Oh. Uh, before enrolling at Broward Community College. Hmm. Broward Community. College. Broward Community. Wow, look at that. And here's some... Uh, see, he still looks like a decent dude. Yeah, he's a, he's a good... I'll give it to him. He's yeah. a good looking guy. Yeah, I mean, he's not the... He doesn't give me the creeps if I, you know, like some do. Well, wait. I, know, I get it. I'm the, just saying right now. This uh, this attractiveness does not last. Well, I, I'm sure, <laughs> but I'm just saying, I, right now, if I saw this guy coming at me down the street, I'd be like, I wouldn't even think nothing of it. Right, yeah. I'd just keep on walking. Yeah, he's a typical. Yeah, but if you know, if it was retrospect, I'd be like, oh yeah, that dude's f-ing messed up. Yeah, he spec spec looked weird <laughs> yeah, from yeah. day one, yeah, basically. Exactly. Um, all right, so the college years here. Schaefer initially enrolled as a social studies major at Broward Community College in September 1964. Social studies. Before switching his focus to teaching, mm. in which he achieved average grades. Upon completion of his sophomore year at Broward, he applied for and was accepted for scholarship. At Florida Atlantic University in oh, Boca yeah. Raton. Yeah. That's a big. Yeah. Big uh, step up. Yeah. Um, and he begins his studies there in 1968 with aspirations to obtain a Bachelor of Arts in Education. Okay. So now still, he still wants to be a teacher. Still wants to be a teacher. Okay. In December of 1968, Schaefer marries his fiance, Martha, a.k.a. Marty. Martha. L- Louise Fogg, F-O-G-G. Okay. Uh, she's a fellow FAU student. Who years? Uh, who's two years younger than him, and who he met at Broward. Okay, and with whom he had briefly toured uh, in her patriotic singing troupe, Sing Out '66. <laughs> He's googling again. Sing Out '66. Yeah, he briefly toured in her patriotic singing troupe, Sing Out '66, which offered an alternative to the contemporary hippie movement. Oh. So that he's Googling again. This is slowly going to turn into a show with a whole bunch of dead air and us just always Googling. No, 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 no. Just, just looking. See if there's something out there. It doesn't show anything. No, no tracks to play? Any no, samples? Of, not. No, okay. Damn it, man. I was hoping I was going to buy a record or something. The couple rented a property on uh, Southwest 22nd Street in Fort Lauderdale. Although their relationship soon soured, uh, both due to Schaefer's incessant demands for sex, and his spending much of his free time hunting. Wait a minute. Yeah. It went south because of the, he wanted sex? That guy. I, I can only imagine what kind of sex he wanted. I, that, yeah. Just in knowing what his fantasies yeah, are. Yeah. Yeah. I'm assuming he probably wanted it nonstop and he wanted it in those weird auto erotic yeah, asphyxiation, asphyxiation ways. Yeah. ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the two divorced on May 2nd, 1970. His wife citing Schaefer's extreme cruelty as the reason for their separation. Okay. Shortly thereafter, Schaefer formed a belief. I'm sorry. Schaefer formed a brief relationship with a physically disabled woman. Okay. Whom he encountered at a Fort Lauderdale mental health clinic. 
Okay. Although the couple soon separated. What the f***? So they didn't last very long. Damn. I hope not. In March 1969, Schaefer successfully applied for a student teaching internship at Plantation High School. He began this position on September 23rd of 69, primarily teaching geography, but was fired on November 7th for refusing to accept advice from his superiors and for continuously attempting to impose his own moral and political opinions upon his students. Now, that sounds like something that would happen today. Yeah, today would be acceptable because uh, we see it. Yeah. So um, he, it says here that the, the, the school fired him because of numerous complaints uh, being received from parents about him forcing his views on them, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Uh, shortly afterwards, Schaefer unsuccessfully applied for a student teaching position at Boca Raton Community High School. Four months later, in March of 1970, Schaefer successfully applies for another teaching internship. Okay. This application was accepted, and he began teaching geography at Stranahan High School on April 2nd. Okay. Um, progress reports indicate Schaefer performed poorly as a teacher there at Stranahan High. Okay. Uh, with his superiors noting both his arrogance and his very limited knowledge of the subject he taught. Isn't geography what he studied? Yeah. I thought so. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah exactly. You had bad grades there for a while. Yeah. Seven weeks after Schaefer commenced his teaching position, the principal of Stranahan High, High School, Stranahan High School. High School. <laughs> Whatever the hell that was. What was that? I don't know. High School. <laughs> Informed him the school's decision to withdraw him from the internship. Oh. His career as a student teacher formally ended the following day um, on May 19th. He just went to another school. They didn't, check, they didn't check back then. Yeah. Well, funny you should mention that. Oh. Shortly after the termination uh, of his teaching career, uh, he vacationed in Europe and North Africa before returning to Florida. Okay. Where he briefly worked for the Wacken Hut Corporation. Security. Wacken Hut Security Corporation. Yep. Uh, he was working as a security guard as he pondered his next career move. On September 1st, 1970, mm -hmm. Schaefer applied for a vacancy with the Wilton Manors Police Department. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. He failed to disclose the fact that he had twice been fired from student teaching positions. We'll just leave that off the resume. Yep, we'll leave that off and out of the way. Uh, instead, he falsely claimed to have acquired two years' experience as a research assistant at FAU and to have recently returned to the U.S. from Morocco. Oh. So he's just, he's full he's all, of lies. Yeah, full of lies. Of course, you know, back then, anyway, what were they going to follow up with? How, I, guess, I mean, if you call around, I guess, but. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot of late work. Yeah. Uh, Schaefer's previous work history was not verified by anybody, and he was formally inducted into the Broward County Police Department in September 1971. Well, I mean, went to the community college at least. Yeah. He graduated as a patrolman at the end of that year at age 25. Wow. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. I can only imagine one of those goes from here. Oh, it gets better. It gets yep. better, Mike. Mm -hmm. In January 1971, seven months before Schaefer began his career as a police officer, he met a 19 year old secretary named Teresa Dean while he was still working as a security guard. Okay. The two soon became engaged and married. Oh, in okay. Fort got remarried. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, they wow. married in Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale on September 11th. According to Schaefer, his second marriage was more harmonious than his first. Oh. Why, you might ask? Because his wife willingly acquiesced to his frequent demands for sex. Oh, so she was into this. Yeah. Okay. So she was into it. He, he also found the right, right mate. Right, yeah. Someone that was like, all right, you know, do whatever. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Go for it, man. Yep. Um... She also apparently shared his passion for fishing um, and enjoyed going to the Florida Keys with him. So they share some interests. Yeah, they got some interests. Good that's for good. them. Well, that's, good, that's a good couple to have. Schaefer's tenure with the Wilton Manors Police lasted only six months. Oh, not good. Although he earned a commendation from his superiors um, on one occasion relating to his conduct during a police raid on a drug house, okay. his general performance was considered to be poor. He was dismissed from the, his, his position when his superiors discovered his habit of stopping cars driven by female motorists uh, who had committed minor traffic infractions, then entering their license plate info into the database to obtain, obtain further personal information about those female. Okay. Uh, let's, let's go. Just let's go back. back up. Okay. Let's back up. 
So how could you score poorly on a drug raid? I mean, what? think about what did he do to score poorly? Oh, no, no, no. He got a commendation for stuff he did during the drug raid. Oh, he did? He I got thought, a commendation. Okay, like, uh, okay. He got an attaboy for that. But he they scored were poorly saying, afterwards. They said, although his general performance as okay. a police officer okay. was considered poor. What the hell are you doing wrong, though? <sighs> well, well, you got to really... One of them was pulling over female drivers. Well, yeah. Getting their information by running their plate and then later contacting them and requesting dates. I thought that's how they did it back then. I would say that's probably what earned him a yeah. pro- poor perform- performance evaluation from the police department. Yeah, that would be it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, you did you did a great job when you kicked that door in for the drug raid. Yeah. But like you constantly pulling over females and then calling them and asking them out, that's not really yeah. something yeah. we do. Yeah. So and you're married. <laughs> yeah, you just got married, dude. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing? Some of this oh. Shortly before his dismissal, Schaefer had begun searching for a better paying law enforcement job anyway. Okay. Uh, he begins his service as a deputy oh. with, with the Martin County Sheriff's Department on June 30, uh, June 23rd, 1972. Okay. So, yeah, it is a step up. Yeah. So, yeah, he went from the small town. Now he's going to county for a, full big, county. a decent sized county. Yeah. yeah. However, he got the job by forging a letter of recommendation. Of course. From Wilton Manners. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yes. Um, and a standard background check revealed he had no criminal record. So basically they were like, oh. well, we got this letter from the past police department. They say yeah. he's a great guy. But why? And, and he doesn't have any felonies. So why call his work references or anything? Let's yeah, just hire let's him. Let's just hire him because he sounds like a great guy. Let's just put him out there. Put him out there. See, this he kind of he's starting he's to look starting creepy, a here. creepy here. That's a little Ted Bundy ish, isn't it? Yep. This isn't fair. This photo is from court, which happens later. Then this isn't his time as a deputy. This oh, okay. is after some of his other incidents. But okay, I just wanted to show a different photo here. But he is getting, he's getting that creeper look now. Mm-hmm. Like this looks like someone on the sex offender registry. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The tie don't match either. No. Hey kids, I got a whole freezer full of popsicles in my basement. <laughs> That's kind of what he looks like, like a younger version of what's that guy's name on <laughs> Family Guy? Yeah. Oh, oh man, crap. I can't think of it right now. Okay, oh. here's here's where it gets good. So he's a deputy now with Martin County in Florida. On the afternoon of July twenty first, nineteen seventy two, Schaefer encounters two teenage hitchhikers named Nancy Ellen Trotter, who was eighteen, okay, and Paula Sue Wells, who was seventeen. And he, he comes across these two girls while he's officially working as a deputy sheriff. He's on patrol when he yeah, finds yeah, these I get girls. It, yeah. He drives the pair to their intended destination of Stewart, Florida. Okay. Although he cautioned the girls against the perils of hitchhiking. So far, so good. Yeah. Girls, hey, I'm a police officer. Not really safe for two young girls to be out here hitchhiking in the middle of the Florida Everglades. Let the police officer give you a ride. Yeah, because you never know who's going to pick you up. Right. I mean, you get picked up by a serial killer. Exactly. Alligator. So, hey, we're, we're giving a little good police officer advice here. Yeah. Let the police officer give you a ride. Not a good idea to get in strange cars with strange men. Correct. I get it. But it's, you're okay with me because I got this on. Yeah, I got I got the badge and, the, the, badge and the car and yeah. it's safe. Yeah. Police officer. Right. Or deputy sheriff. You want a sticker? You want a sticker? <laughs> Junior deputy. Uh, upon learning that neither girl was native to Florida. Oh. And that the two intended to travel to Jensen Beach the following day, Schaefer proposed to drive them to the location. Oh. The girls accepted his offer and agreed to meet him at uh, a bandstand on East Ocean Boulevard at 9.15 a.m. the following morning. Because I guess this is a distance. So he's working. He can't really go take a four-hour drive or whatever it would be while he's working. So he says, hey, meet me here tomorrow morning. I'll pick you up and I'll drive you. Okay. The following morning. Uh. Schaefer arrives at the bandstand at the prearranged time. On this occasion, he was not wearing his uniform, and he's driving his own personal vehicle. Okay. Although he convinced Trotter and Wells, he was still on duty. Okay. He, I guess he told them he was switched to some kind of plainclothes undercover detail. That's why he's not in a uniform anymore. Oh, okay. I get it. I get and it. And that, you know, it's not his car. He's driving an unmarked, unmarked county car. police car. Yeah. Right. Shortly after the girls enter his vehicle, Schaefer deviates from their intended route 
um, on the pretext of showing the girls, quote, an old Spanish fort. So he wants to show them, he wants to give them a tour. Was he taking them over to St. Augustine? What? Uh, well, <laughs> apparently this is near Hutchinson Island. Okay. Oh, yeah. On the way, he again briefly lectures the girls against accepting <laughs> lifts from random strangers and the dangers of being sold into white slavery. Oh. Okay. Well, I mean, you know. So he stops the vehicle close to a dilapidated shed deep inside a remote forest, and he handcuffs and gags both girls. He then took one victim to a large cypress tree close to the Indian River. He ties her legs to the trunk just below her knees before binding a noose around her neck, which he affixed to a branch in such a manner as to force her to stand up um, upon the exposed roots. So this is basically described as it's tight enough. She's not hanging, but she's having to kind of stand on her yeah. tippy toes to keep from yeah. being hung. Um, he then took the other victim to another tree a short distance away where she too was bound in a similar fashion. And she was forced to stand upon a narrow exposed tree root as a makeshift um, counter pressure from the noose. Okay. Both of them were informed that they were to be raped and murdered. So he told both of them, you're going to be raped and murdered. Okay. Well, I mean, he's been up front with them all along. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. At that moment, Schaefer receives an urgent radio dispatch call. Oh. Okay. Informing him to immediately report to the police station. Oh. So he leaves both girls in that state. Okay. Bound, standing up, noosed to a tree. Yeah. And he told them that he would soon return and apparently told them, I got to go. Uh, they were warned not to try and run away, quote, because I'm not going to be very far down the road. Okay. So he tells them, hey, I got this call. Yeah, it's be right down the street. I'm just right down here, so don't you try and run, because yep. I'll see you if you try to run out of here. Yep. Um, and basically, he told them that he was going to meet with the person he was intending to sell them to. Oh, okay. Well, well as, he, they just said he's going to rape and murder them. Well, he didn't say he was. He said, you're about to be raped and murdered. Oh, okay. And now he's telling him, I got to go meet the guy who I'm going to sell you guys to. Because remember, we were talking about the mm -hmm. slavery thing. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. I'm going to go meet the guy I'm selling you to. Be right back. Yeah. Okay. When Schaefer returned to the forest approximately two hours later. Yeah, he, I, hope, I hope they're gone. He discovers both girls had escaped. Thank God. Right. He immediately returns home and calls his station where he informed Sheriff Robert Crowder, quote, I've done something very foolish. You'll be mad at me. Schaefer then proceeded to explain that he had decided to teach two girls a lesson on the risks of hitchhiking, but might have overdone it. <laughs> I'd say, yeah. I think I went a little too far on this one. He then proceeded to explain that he had abandoned the two in the general swampland area of Hutchinson Island, not far from the Indian River. Okay. So Sheriff Crowder and Lieutenant Melvin Waldron. You get an award? Who? Oh, like Schaefer for, yeah, for great job yeah, teaching him a lesson. Teaching him a lesson. There you go. <laughs> Sheriff Crowder and Lieutenant Waldron immediately proceeded to Florida State Road A1A, uh, where close by the highway, they discovered a desperate, partially gagged teenage girl with her hands pin pinioned behind her back, swimming via a flutter kick. In a subtropical river. So can you imagine? She's handcuffed behind her back, mm -hmm. and she's trying to get across this river. She can't touch the bottom. I don't... I'm just trying to imagine what that's like with your hands behind your back trying to swim and keep your head above water. Why would you try it? There's gators. Well, she's trying to get the hell out of there because she thinks that. this guy's coming back. I get it, but man, there's... The water would be the last place I'd want to go into in Florida. So uh, they, these two, the sheriff and this other lieutenant... They observe this girl claim her out of the riverbank. Um, sections of her jeans and blouse have been shredded. Um, and she's trying to get their attention. She's trying to wave yeah, them down. Yeah. Um, upon removing the gag from her mouth, the officers heard her identify herself as Nancy. Mm -hmm. And she also told them that her friend was somewhere in the forest. Hey, I got a friend. Oh, that, crap. Yeah. To Trotter's relief, she was informed that a truck driver um, had discovered Wells the other girl okay. as well. So she got picked up. A truck driver found her uh, walking through a woodland area. Okay. Um, about 45 minutes earlier. I wonder what the hell was up with that. So, yeah, she's already at the police station. Okay. So yeah. both girls safe and sound, other than traumatized. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. So the girls uh, the girls are driven to the station, 
where uh, Trotter and Wells, the two girls, they recounted their ordeal to Sheriff Crowder. Both girls stated that they had managed to escape from their bindings by gingerly um, writhing against their restraints and loosening their gags with their teeth as they maintained their balance upon the exposed tree roots. So they had to escape, but they also couldn't fall off this tree root or they're going to end up yeah, they're gonna hanging. Be dead, yeah. Um, in the process of freeing themselves, um, it had taken a considerable amount of time and that they had um, been acutely aware that had they slipped, they would have hanged. Mm. Both girls provided a detailed description of their assailant and his vehicle. Well, yeah. Before formally identifying Schaefer as an individual responsible for their ordeal. Mm -hmm. Although Schaefer repeated his insistence that he had simply overreacted, yeah, overreacted in his efforts to demonstrate the dangers of hitchhiking. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. It's not, I can see how that happened. It happened. Yeah. yeah, yeah right. Yeah. His story was obviously not believed. Oh. Um, and he was dismissed from the force and placed under arrest oh, good. immediately. Yes. With uh, Sheriff Crowder instructing his offer officers to file charges of false imprisonment and aggravated assault against them immediately. Yes. So good. Yeah. Approximately two weeks after his arrest, Schaefer posted a 15,000 bail, $15,000 oh. bail. Can't imagine the bail is only 15,000. Well, I mean, they, he didn't murder him, I guess. No, no. It's what, kidnapping at this point. Yeah, and, pretty much. Uh, false imprisonment, false battery. Imprisonment, fine, but whatever, battery. Yeah. Um, so he had a $15,000 bail. He paid it. And um, he remained at liberty uh, prior to his scheduled November 1972 trial. Okay. He returns to his house and his second wife. Remember, he's married. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Um, hey, honey, I got fired today. And his wife and in-laws later noted no change in his demeanor or behavior believing that his claim uh, to have simply been trying to teach them a lesson. Okay, yes. So so his wife buys into the whole... She believes him. Yeah, okay, buys into she's it. She's in love with him. Yeah. As Schaefer awaited trial, he obtained um, menial employment at Quick Check. K-W-I-K Check? Like oh, okay. a check cashing place. Oh, okay. Yeah. They were they were big back yeah. back then. You see, you go back to Whacking Hut. <laughs> Whacking Hut security. All right, Georgia. this this brings us to these two, Georgia Jessup and Susan Place. Okay. So on September 27th, 1972, now he's out on bail. Okay, okay. Well, he's waiting on trial. Right. Schaefer abducted two teenage friends named Schaefer and, or I'm sorry, Place and Jessup here. Picture yeah. it if you're watching. Um, They're 17 and 16, respectively. Jesus. The two had encountered Schaefer while all three attended an adult education center in Fort Lauderdale. Schaefer introduced himself to the girls as Jerry Shepard, claiming he was from Colorado. Oh, okay. So now we're, I mean, he's in trouble. So now I got to lie about yeah, my yeah, name and where I'm yeah, from. Yeah, you can't see who he is. Now you're trying to cover up. Yeah. On the afternoon of their disappearance, Place's mother, Lucille, arrived home to find her daughter straightening her room up as Jessup sat on a chair in the bedroom. Both introduced her to a man in his 20s whom they referred to as Jerry, but yeah, is Schaefer. Yeah. Um, initially informed uh, her mother that uh, Jessup and Jerry intended to travel from Fort Lauderdale to a beach to play guitar. All okay. The, well, it's kind of that time. It's kind of hippie. Well, we're going to go do a bonfire on the beach, play guitar, sing Kumbaya. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Although Place's mother was suspicious, uh, yeah, this Jerry assured her his intentions were noble. Of I, course. I promise. Yes. Nonetheless, she noted the number of his 1969 Datsun. She writes down his license plate. Datsun. Datsun. Datsun? Datsun? Wow. Well, that's a Chicago coming out. Chicago. I got a Chicago thing. But anywho, her, her mother, so she writes down the plate of, this, okay. of, of Schaefer's car. Um, Place confirmed her mother's suspicions that she intended to leave home, although she tearfully assured her that she would be gone just for just a little while. So basically what's happening here is that mom thinks – daughter's running away yeah sounds like it but she's kind of saying no i'll be no, home I'll in be a little home. bit but yeah. she's crying while telling her mom that which is i think a clear signal she's not coming home, home anytime soon yeah um the girls left uh the place household with schaefer at approximately 8 45 p.m when place had not returned after four days lucille mom first contacted jessup's mother the other girl um only to learn that her daughter had run away on September 27th. Oh. So now they're getting the picture. The girls ran away together with this guy. Yeah. Uh, and that she likewise, 
uh, likewise had not heard from either girl since that evening. Okay. Both girls were subsequently reported missing to Oakland Park Police. Lucille provided investigators with the vehicle registration she had noted, Mm -hmm. in addition to a physical description of the man the girls had left the home with. Okay. The registration was traced to an entirely separate model of vehicle belonging to a St. Petersburg resident who did not resemble Jerry Shepard. So he stole a plate. So, well, no, they're running the actual plate. But the but the plate the the person that is registered to that plate number is he doesn't match the it's a completely different dude. That's what I'm saying. He stole the plate, probably yeah. off another car, put on put on this car, or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, because it wasn't a stolen car; it's just a plate issue. Yeah. Um. Also, this guy had a firm alibi, but he didn't match the script. You know, the mom yeah. was like, yeah, "No, mom, that's not the dude." Yeah. Um. The sole Jerry Shepard, because that's the name they had. Um, registered as living in Fort Lauderdale, was also eliminated from police inquiries. And by early 1973, the teenager's disappearance had largely become a cold case. So these girls just disappeared, basically. Yeah. In December 1972, Schaefer appeared in court in relation to the Trotter and Wells abduction. Okay. Due to a plea bargain, his attorney strongly recommended he accept. Schaefer was able to plead guilty to just one charge of aggravated assault for which he received a sentence of one year in jail with the possibility of parole after six months. Okay. So I don't know if the court was kind of like, maybe it's believable he was trying to teach it, but that seems pretty light. Six months in jail for abducting two girls. Well, plus his first defense. True. Yeah, throw that in there. And then his time, his time that he was in county. Time he's been on, basically he's been on free trial release, I guess you could say, of the day. So all that time counts. Right. So, yeah. True. Uh, but it, it was to be followed by three years probation. Okay. So, yeah, it makes sense. So six months in jail and then three years yeah, probation. Yeah, I can see that for what he did. Yeah. Upon passing the sentence down on December 22nd, Judge D.C. Smith lambasted Schaefer, informing him, quote, it is beyond the court's imagination to conceive how you were such a foolish and astronomic jackass as you were in this case. Yeah. Quote. That's that's a quote. Yeah. He allowed Schaefer's formal sentencing to be postponed until after the holidays, and Schaefer began serving his sentence in the Martin County Jail on January 15th, 1973. I just think if this was like today's times, it would have been all over the newspaper. Oh, yeah. The news. That mom wouldn't know him. Because she'd be like, why should be like, oh, my God, that's the way girls go home with. Oh, yeah, because it'd be a huge police officer yeah. sentenced to abducting girls. Yeah. You've got a missing dog. Yeah, you'd be like, that's that's, Dude, the, that's guy. the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Shows you how different times are. I, I know. Right. Um, Schaefer informed several reporters after his, sentencing, after his sentencing, quote, I made a stupid mistake. There was no sex involved. No one was hurt. That's his statement. Oh, they were hurt. I get like yeah, physically I, I they may not have been. I think mentally they're a little uh, kind of messed up. Yeah. I don't think you realize how many years of uh, therapy you've you got them going to. Yeah. Yeah. So now let's move forward to March 1973. Okay. okay. Lucille Place, which is the mother of Susan, Susan. here. Yep. She discovers a letter penned by Jerry Shepard hmm. in her daughter's bedroom. So she's at the point now, mom's probably going crazy. Her daughter's still missing. It's a cold case. Hasn't heard from her. She's going through her stuff now. Finds this letter from Jerry, Jerry Shepard. Shepherd. She drives to the return address on the letter. 333 Martin Avenue in he Stewart, Florida. Dumbass. Only to learn the building manager, or learn from the building manager that Jerry Shepard had registered at the property under his real name, Gerard Schaefer. So not only use his real address, but then when you go to that address, yeah, yeah. use his yeah, real, real name. name. Yeah. Stupid. Stupid. And uh, the property manager there also informs mom that Jerry Sha- or Gerard Schaefer uh, was recently sent to jail for the abductions and attempted hanging of two girls. Which as a mother, I can't believe here what yeah. it'd be like to yeah, hear yeah, that. I'd be like, holy shit, my daughter's dead. Yeah. As Lucille and her husband drove around the county she realized investigators had likely incorrectly noted Schaefer's license plate number as being registered in Pinellas County as opposed to Martin County. Given the fact most license plates she observed in Martin County began with a 42 and not a four like Pinellas County. Mm -hmm. So basically she told them the plate was 42 D seven, three, and they were running four D seven, three and going, Oh, well that's not the guy. guy. So a simple 
didn't write something down wrong could have prevented all this. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Which is crazy. Um, so upon relaying this new information to the police, Lucille discovered the plate she had noted actually belonged to the blue-green Datsun. Dot, okay. Datsun? Datsun. Datsun. Registered to the one and only Gerard, Gerard Schaefer. Schaefer. Who resided at 333 Martin Avenue. Yeah. When questioned, Schaefer denied ever having encountered Place or her parents, although Lucille positively identifies him. Um, like, I think they show her a Wilton Manors personnel photograph of Schaefer, because that would have been from a couple years yeah. prior. Yeah. And and she says, that's Jerry Shepard. Like, this is the man that was in my house yeah. that my daughter was leaving with. Crazy. On the afternoon of April 1st, a father and son searching for discarded aluminum cans discovered the extensively decomposed remains of two individuals scattered within and around a hole dug among trees in the Oak Hammock Park, Port St. Lucie, Florida area. Yep. Yeah. The location of this grave was 212 feet from the nearest dirt road, and the grave itself was uh, two feet, three inches deep. So wow. shallow, shallow, shallow grave. Deep scratch marks were evident upon the base of the tree immediately alongside the grave site. Still alive. Around the roots. Well, no, I think from the, because remember the first two girls, they were standing on the roots like they were being hung. Oh, yeah. And so if you start slipping, you start getting scratch marks all yep. over. So he did it again. Yeah. Okay. Um, those uh, scratched up roots were found close by to where sections of a torso had been found at the base of the trunk of the tree. One victim wore the remnants of blue jeans emblazoned with a circular emblem of the Roadrunner, like okay. Wiley Coyote uh, yeah. and the Roadrunner. Okay. And the other was completely nude. A pile of clothing belonging to the decedents was discovered in nearby undergrowth. Hmm. Sections of both bodies had evidently been uh, disinterred and scattered by wildlife. Well, so he, grave. Yeah, he dug a shallow dry, grave, tried to bury him, and the animals got yeah. to it, basically. That's why they, they do the shallow graves. You, like on purpose, mm -hmm. it'd probably be smarter just to leave them out in the open then. They can get be even quicker that yeah. way. The location of the discoveries was approximately six miles from where Trotter and Wells had been held captive. So the first two girls, six miles away from where he did it to those, yeah. those two girls. Because that probably would have been where they ended up. Both these girls had obviously been found bound and murdered with their spinal cords severed at the lumbar. God. And their cervical section and several bones completely severed with a knife or machete. I, can, I mean, I, dude, I've had a spinal cord injury. I get it. That's that area down there. I go, oh, oh God. Yeah. Uh, the bodies had been decapitated after death, mm. and their jaw bones had sustained numerous fractures. One set of remains, later identified as Place, had also sustained a gunshot wound to her lower jaw, consistent with having been inflicted by a twenty two caliber pistol. So he's punching yeah. them, breaking their jaw, shooting yeah. them in the face. Just, yeah, he's, yeah, he's destroying them. He's doing everything. Yeah. Furthermore, sections of wearing of tree bark uh, upon a banyan tree approximately nine feet from the grave indicated one or both victims had been suspended from the tree long enough to leave welt impressions within the bark prior to their deaths. Mm. And the initials GJ had been carved into the tree trunk. George Jessup. Well, Gerard, John, oh, yeah, Schaefer. Schaefer. But his first and middle initial carved into the tree. Yeah. Uh, the roots of this tree, uh, which bore several deep knife, machete, or axe incisions containing torn sections of clothing and fibers. So he's also axing and macheting them up against these. I wonder how much of that they were alive for. I mean, I just wonder how much of that he kept them alive for my hope is they passed out immediately well I, my hope is that he, he took them out immediately but i don't think he did yeah mm. the bodies were taken to the dade county medical examiner's department where dr richard cerevron formally identified the victims via dental records and healed bone fractures as place in jessup on april 5th mm -hmm. shortly thereafter schaefer was informed of the identifications he immediately requested representation of a public defender. Okay. The individual appointed as his legal representative was Elton Schwartz. <laughs> does that not sound yeah. like a public defender? Yeah. No does. offense to any public defenders listening, but I was talking about like the movies. Usually yeah. they try yeah. to make like public defenders pretty nerdy, goofy. Yeah. Elton Schwartz is a perfect I think name. Be a perfect name. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, the location of these discoveries and the decedent's identities, plus the similarities and the modus operandi of the method of abduction and murder of Place and Jessup to Schaefer's earlier captivity of Trotter and Wells, led police in Broward County and Martin County to obtain search warrants for Schaefer's house and vehicle. Okay. As well as the home of his mother. Oh. After Place's mother formally identified Schaefer as being the man he had last seen with her daughter and Jessup. So police first go to Schaefer's mom's house. Okay. Okay. Inside a locked bedroom at the Mm -hmm. Fort Lauderdale residence of Schaefer's mother, police find 300 pages of lurid stories, occasionally accompanied by crude illustrations. Schaefer had both penned and typed over the course of several years. These stories detailed the kidnapping, humiliation, rape, and execution by hanging of a number of teenage girls and young women whom he routinely referred to as, quote, whores, sluts, and harlots. Okay. Including two named Belinda and Carmen. Oh. Okay. And an unidentified woman whom he graphically describes hanging at an unknown location close to Powerline Road. Hmm. Several of these narratives indicate Schaefer had forced his victims to drink beverages, typically beer or wine, as they stood upon makeshift plinths. I'm going to change that word to planks. Planks. With a noose around their necks so that he could observe them urinate prior to their hanging. It just keeps getting sicker. He likes to watch them urinate, apparently. Yeah. He had frequently returned to his crime scenes weeks or months after the actual murders in order to commit acts of necrophilia. So he is going back to the bodies weeks and months after they've been deceased Mm -hmm. to have relations with these corpses. Oh, God, dude. Mm. or to extract teeth, which he kept as charms. Yeah. His writings also revealed... could you imagine? Dude. Oh. Are you still thinking about the necrophilia? Oh, that, yeah. That's the something sm- I will never understand as necrophilia. The smell. Mm. How? That's the thing. If we could get in the minds. Oh, I know. I know. Because I, obviously this is something that has a psychological and physical, yeah. you know, he has reactions to, he's turned on by it. So there's, yeah, there's a crossed wire somewhere, but he's going to have that smell on him. Right. So it's not like you can, you got to go home and, oh, dude, I, I just, ooh, the whole idea of it. Yeah. Uh, it's messed up. Yeah. I, I don't, I just don't get it. The writings that the police found at mom's house also reveal Schaefer's fascination with historical methods of torture and execution and the pleasure he derived from observing acutely distressed females urinate and or defecate prior to and at the time of their actual hanging. So he's not only turned on by killing women, like he's turned on by the very specific action of them urinating or defecating as they're dying. Yeah. Like that's a very specific. Yes. Thing. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. Also found at the Fort Lauderdale residence were 11 guns, bags filled with live and spent cartridges, 13 hunting knives, sections of rope, scores of softcore pornographic magazines, oh, which he had modified to depict nude urinating women bound with ropes hanging from trees or makeshift gallows or uh, bearing bullet wounds. Other images recovered were 37 black and white Polaroid photographs depicting women being hung and or mutilated typically. um, And typically it seemed to be in like undergrowth an undergrowth area in Davie, Florida. Although the focus of these images was insufficient to permit identification of the subjects. Correct. Several other images depicted Schaefer dressed in female garments, simulating his own hanging from a tree with fecal matter smeared across his buttocks. This is a this is a new kind yeah, I, of sick and yeah. like this is cra- and this dude was a teacher and a cop for a yeah. period of time yeah. like yeah woof and he went to good schools yeah he went to a private high school basically yeah. and a good college good colleges yeah he was for the most part came from a decent background went the best right but it was better than not horrific yeah I mean not. Not enough that I think it would really damage him that bad, but obviously it did. Yeah. Inside a gold jewelry box found at the home, investigators discovered personal possessions such as jewelry, passports, and clothing 
belonging to several teenage girls and young women. Some of these items, such as a distinctive heart-shaped charm inscribed with the initials MTN, investigators were unable to link to missing or murdered individuals. Others were identified as belonging to young women who had been reported missing in recent years. Okay. So safe to say, I would assume he's had something to do with their disappearance. Yeah, he's been pretty active, sounds like. One gold locket inscribed with the name Lee, L-E-I-G-H, was um, was determined to belong to a missing woman named Lee Hainline Bonandis, who had been a neighbor of Schaefer's when both were teenagers and who had been missing since September 1969. Wow. Also recovered was a driver's license belonging to Barbara Ann Wilcox and a passport belonging to Colette Marie Goodenow, oh. both of whom had been reported missing in January 1973. Furthermore, (laughs) teeth and sections of bone later identified as belonging to at least eight separate victims were also recovered from mom's property. And mom didn't know any of this, probably. Oh, probably. No clue. Blind eye. Locked bedroom door. It's his room. It's his room. Don't need to go in there. Right. Yeah. So they leave mom's house and they go over to his house. Probably nothing there. Well, on April 6th, uh, they searched Schaefer's Martin County residence. Although it yielded less physical evidence, um, investigators did recover two human teeth oh, okay. s- stowed in a plastic capsule inside the mas- master bedroom. Oh. Several knives and firearms inside a utility shed and an extensively blood-stained white pillowcase, which had evidently been washed. Hmm. Jessup's distinctive suede purse was discovered to have been in the possession of Schaefer's wife. So Jessup here, not only does he kill these people, but he takes souvenirs home to his family. Yes. Hey, honey, I went and bought you a new purse today. Or got to get you a new purse at Goodwill. Schaefer's wife later informed police her husband had given her the item as a gift in what she thought was around November of the previous year, but had attempted to persuade both her and his brother-in-law Henry Dean to discard the item upon uh, learning of the April 1st discovery. So to clarify, he gives her this purse as a gift back in November. The announcement is made that we have found these two young women dead. And he goes to his wife and brother-in-law and says, we need to get rid of that purse. (laughs) Why? Yeah. Why? 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 Why Why do you got to get rid of the purse? What's wrong with the purse? Yeah. I love this purse. I'll get you a different one. Well, I don't like that one. She asked him why. They both asked him why. And his response was that police may use the item to, quote, make up some kind of evidence against him. I still would ask why. Why? Yeah, why? (laughs) Why? What's up with that? (laughs) Why? Yeah, I got a lot of whys. So despite Schaefer's efforts, his brother-in-law gives the item to police. Yeah. And says, this is kind of weird that, Mm -hmm. you know. And to think of it, he's still got a wife, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's kind of a... Uh... There's his 1973 arrest photo. Yeah. He looks good. <laughs> I mean, he, he's, he hasn't really gone too far yet. Yeah. But he's on the way. He looks a lot worse than those college yeah. photos. I mean, yeah. I look a lot worse than my college photos, but... He looks tired, too. He looks tired of... Having all this weight on his shoulders, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Or just say. Just wait till I show you a prison photo. I know. That's kind of I the can't wait. that's kind of the nail in the in the pervert coffin. On May 12th, investigators had gathered gathered enough physical and circumstantial evidence to link Schaefer to nine murders okay. and unsolved disappearances between 1969 and 1973. So a period of four years. Wow. The same month, a uh, periodical published uh published a list of 28 murdered or missing individuals believed to be linked to Schaefer. The majority of these individuals hailed from Florida, although two victims each hailed from Iowa and West Virginia. At a press conference held on May 14th, Chief Investigator Lem Brumley Jr. Lem? Lem, L-E-M. L-E-M. Is that short for anything? Lemuel. Lemuel? That's a name? I've never heard of that before. Lemuel, yeah. Anyway, he informs the media that, quote, in terms of scope and bizarreness, the case was the biggest he had encountered in his career to date. Wow. On May 18th, Schaefer was formally charged with first-degree murder for the killings of Place and Jessup. 
He was held without bond pending trial and transferred to Florida State Hospital in Chattahoochee to undergo 30 days of psychiatric examinations before being returned to St. Lucie uh, County Jail on June. Which I'm assuming he failed. Well, the results of these examinations revealed Schaefer to be an individual suffering from suffering from paranoia, psychosis, and acute sexual deviation who viewed himself as, quote, an eliminator of women he deemed immoral. So he's one of these guys. He's like these guys that go out and get all the prostitutes. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're immoral, so I'm doing God's work. Of by, course, yeah, by eliminating them, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, centers, whatever. Importantly, though, although they said he was paranoid and psychotic and had all these issues, they deemed him mentally competent to stand trial. Good. Finally. Yeah. You know, good. we see one like this. Yeah. At a circuit court hearing on June 21st, District Attorney Robert Stone successfully argued before Judge Cyrus Pfeiffer Trowbridge that Schaefer was sane and thus competent to stand trial. Schaefer vehemently protested his innocence, uh, claiming the accusations against him were, quote, a mistake. And informing one reporter, he remained confident he would be exonerated. <laughs> wow. Schaefer's brought to trial on September 17th, 1973. He was tried in St. Lucie County before Judge Trowbridge. The prosecution team consisted of Stone and Philip Shaler, assisted by Richard Purdy and Anthony Young. Schaefer was defended by Schwartz. And that's it. And Bruce Colton. Oh. That's kind of another name, that kind of fitting. Um, and also assisted by James Brecker. Oh. That's probably some college kid that got in there working in their office. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah. We don't know yeah. for sure. Yeah. We're going to get a message from James Brecker. Yeah. What the hell, guys? Hey, what are you talking about? As the murders of Place and Jessup had been committed at a time when the Supreme Court of Florida had declared capital punishment unconstitutional, yeah. prosecutors sought life imprisonment for Schaefer. The defendant pleaded not guilty to the charges against him and frequently uh, conveyed a distant and aloof demeanor throughout the official proceedings, oh, okay. often staring coldly at the prosecution and witnesses as they testified. Or turning to smile at members of the press when a witness testified um, for his counsel. Oh, okay. So he's one of those guys when they're when they're showing damning evidence. Yeah. He's just staring at them like a. D yeah. And then when there's witnesses for him up there, he's, yeah, talking about how good he is. <laughs> hey guys, you hear? Yeah, see, you hear what <laughs> she said? <laughs> see what they're saying? Yeah, I'm not. That's not me. Yeah, I wouldn't do this. <laughs> yeah. Following the closing arguments, the jury began their deliberations at 3.45 p.m. They deliberated for five hours and ten minutes. Surprised it took that wow. long. Well, they ate dinner. They probably had a dinner. Oh, that's probably. Took a break. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Had a, smoked a couple cigarettes, had a nap. <laughs> you yeah. Know. Probably only took them five minutes to come yeah, to this decision. It, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. It had to make it look good. Had to wait for the coffee to be brought in. You yeah. Know. Yeah. And they had to wait for the church to bring down that, that meal for them. <laughs> right. It was good from the night before. So the jury returns with two verdicts um, of guilty for first-degree murder, Good. which Judge Trowbridge formally announced to the court at 11.05 p.m. Upon receipt of this verdict, Schaefer proclaimed his innocence, stating to reporters, quote, that's the roll of the dice. I had a good defense, but I'm innocent. So he's still sticking with the story. Yeah. Wow. Closing arguments to determine the sentence Schaefer should receive began, began on October 3rd and saw the defense argue he should be involuntarily institutionalized under the 1971 Baker Act. It was, but he's not. So basically they're saying, don't send him to prison, send him to the Cush Mental Hospital. But they said he's not. He could stand sure. trial, so he was deemed not yeah. crazy. So why would you send him to a, a well, psych facility? You got, you got to make that. Well, you know, know, you got to make that argument. You got to try. Yeah, they got to argue for him. I, he's got to say he did his job. Yeah, you got to shoot your shot. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to lose your. You want to get, you know, get disbarred because <laughs> you just sat there and did sat nothing. There. Yeah, and sorry to your screw. Yeah, yeah. So the following day, Schaefer was sentenced to two concurrent terms of life imprisonment. Wow. When asked if he had anything to say prior to sentencing, Schaefer proclaimed his innocence once again before requesting he be sent to a psychiatric hospital as opposed to prison. Okay. Yep. He's still trying to get stuck on that psychiatric thing. Yeah. Which, well, because he'd be out in 10 years. Right. Well, and it'd be cush. I mean, I think it'd be cush. Well, of course it would. Get to go meet with doctors, probably have a decent room and bed and food. and Be medicated all the time. Yeah. yeah. Act a little crazy. They come give you the good shot and make you all happy feeling. And yeah. 
And then after so many years, they'd probably be like, yeah, you know, he's reformed. He's a good guy. Yeah. Wow. He is just, he's back to normal. Yeah, he's awesome. He's awesome. We should make him a cop again. Did you guys know he was a cop? <laughs> yeah, we should make him a police officer again. Put him back on the road. Yeah. yeah put him on the, think of a civil cop. <laughs> yeah. On December 3rd, 1995. It's about to show you a picture Jesus. here. Second of good old Schaefer in prison. That's some down the road time there. Down the road. Schaefer is stabbed to death on the floor of his cell. You know, yeah. I'm really surprised it took that long. Yeah. Especially hearing, because usually... Once the word gets out, there's a, you're a cop. Well, that, and it's a young female. So usually people don't mess, you know, yeah. a lot of hardened criminals in prison. You mess with kids or females, you, you don't have very good luck in prison. True, but especially being a cop. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a death sentence in its own. And at this point, it's a huge news story. Surely yeah. other inmates knew who he was. And, well, I mean, you had inmate workers, dude. They hear all this stuff. They knew he's coming in. That's true. You have some guards that sneak some yeah, information. That, and it's all back there in the prison. That guy's still up there getting checked in. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. He hadn't made it to his bunk yet. Yeah. So uh, he had been stabbed over 40 times in the face, head, neck, and body, mm -hmm. with his throat also being slashed, his right eye destroyed, and several ribs fractured. Mm -hmm. His body was discovered after a fellow inmate informed staff of his death. So he, uh, at least they informed him. There's a, he's a little creepy there. He's like full on creeper mode yeah. at this point. Yeah. And I'm not exactly sure what year this photo is from, how close to his death this is, but it's probably yeah. the prison glasses that does it. Yeah. The prison, prison issue. Yeah. Glasses yeah. definitely gives that creeper. That's what I don't get. These guys get out and they keep the go get new glasses. Yeah. Everyone knows those are prison glasses. Yeah. And you look like a chomo wearing them. So go switch them out. They ain't got no money. True. Yeah. Mike, you know what time it is? Yes. Get to play. Get to play. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's Wheel of Death time, baby. Yep. Hope they pick me. So, uh, I don't think we've ever shown this before. Uh oh. But we got to draw a name. Yes. Who are we going to play with? And the way we figure that out is with the Bucket of Doom. Yes. So we, we got the Bucket of Doom. To go along with the wheel of death. Yep. So, uh, Mike, why don't you do the honors here? Right, I'll have, well, hang on. Let me give a shake. Oh, give a shake. I mean, there aren't a whole lot of people in there, but yeah. give a shake. Reach in the bucket of doom. And who do we draw from the bucket of doom to play the wheel of death? Yeah. You got it. You got it. Yep. Who is it? Leanne Sullivan. Leanne Sullivan. Our first person. Our first. I, dude, I'm pumped. Yep. Should we give her a call? Let's give her a call. All right, let's get Leanne on the line and play The Wheel of Death. Yes. Hello, Leanne. Welcome to Two Murder Morons. Hey! Hi. How Thank are you, you doing? for having me. Absolutely. Pleasure to have you on the show. Yes. Are you ready to play The Wheel of Death? Yes, I am. Okay, so a little explanation here of our beautiful Wheel of Death, because we know it's probably kind of hard to read from your vantage point. But you get to choose either myself or Mike to spin. We do have to say... Mike had a really bad track track record for a while where he was always getting death. However, oh, tonight he practiced a few times right before this call and he got some pretty good prizes. So we'll leave that decision up to you. So you'll right. pick one of us. Well, we'll ask you to tell us how hard you want us to spin it. Whatever you land on, you win. So uh, we obviously have a couple spaces that say death, which means Ted Bundy comes on the screen and, and murders you. That's not, not good for you. Yeah, not good for you. Um, but we got stuff like gift cards to our merch store. We've got t-shirts and hats. We've got free membership, uh, free buy me a coffee membership. So Ooh. you would, you get all like the bonus episodes and cool stuff like that. Slide. So who do you, uh, which one of us do you want to uh, spin the wheel? Choose wisely. Um, I think I'm going to go with Andy. Yes, man. This is Hopefully really, I can keep really, the street going. really hurting my heart right now. <laughs> I just have no idea. All right, how hard, do you want me to like just give it all I got? Or you... real quick, oh. where, where are you calling in from? Oh, I'm calling from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Oh, okay, Michigan, how, Michigan. Right, pretty cold there right now, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty cold. Yeah, it yep. seems like we have a pretty big fan base in Michigan. Yeah, I wonder what's up. I mean, y'all might want to think about relocating or something. Hey, hey, that's hey. too cold. No, I, but, but hey, they got things that they don't have here. That's true. True. Oh, oh well. Yeah, anyway. 
All right. So uh, <laughs> you want me to give it all I got, or you want me to kind of give it a half spin? Like what's, yeah, what's your Yeah, I mean, goal? go ahead and give it all you got. Why not? All right. Oh, Lord. All right. You ready? Here we go. Here we go. Round and round it goes. Wow. You get a hat. You want a hat? A hat. Yay. Hats, one of our QMM hats. Yes. You get a hat. Which are really popular. Yeah. The Shrekers hat. They rock. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, congratulations. We will get that hat in the mail to you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank hey. you so much for being a fan and playing Wheel of Death here on Two Murder Morons. Yeah, thanks for playing. Yeah. All right, so that was Leanne playing the Wheel of Death. Finally get a winner. Yes, well, great. Well, we've we've had a... Well, was that on a bonus episode, though? I think yeah, that it was, was a on a bonus. Yes. Our first public... But our first public... Winner. And she got a hat. I know. Won the hat. Uh-huh. Won uh-huh. the Sharker's hat. <laughs> thank God. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, we'll show the hat up here. Up here, I'll put oh, the it one up that I've been wearing. There. Yeah, yeah. Uh, our hat is is different than the rest of our merch. Correct. Um, the way we do hats is uh, through a yearly pre order, so it's kind of like a GoFundMe type thing. But basically, yeah. you order a hat, um, and then we order a whole bunch of them once a year, and we ship them out. It's a yep. great way to support the show. Um, but since she won it on the wheel, she's going to get one right yeah, now. Yep, get it around. She's going to have to wait. Nope, to get it. Just the however it takes the long to get it. Yeah, just the shipping time. Yeah, the shipping time. You know, postal service. Yep. She's in Michigan though, and yeah. it's winter. It yeah, could it get winter. <laughs> it could, could get, get delayed. It could get delayed. Uh, speaking of supporting the show, if you enjoyed this episode and would like to support it, uh, head to buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons. You can simply buy Mike and I a cup of coffee. Yep. Um, or um, you can also sign up to be a member and get exclusive benefits, including bonus episodes, episodes. which we have a ton. I don't yeah. even remember all the subjects of them. I don't either. Six or seven of them already by by this yeah, point. By so this point. you could jump on there now. Um, our smallest level is three bucks. Yeah. And you could get six or seven more episodes. Yep. That you can watch our Check it goofy out. asses. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons if you want to support us that way. Ooh. We also have merch. The merch store. Yep. Get you a nice pair of boxers. Get you. <laughs> Let's tell a little story here. So if you have noticed, I'm wearing a fantastic T-shirt. Yes. That new, has, new to the lineup. It has uh, our faces and our logos, a little bloody knife, a body, a thumbprint, a microphone, all that good stuff. Yeah. But what Mike is referring to, <laughs> say, and I did this on purpose because he had to make a comment during exactly. our trailer. Yeah. But there should be boxers. So there is a boxer form of this. Yes. Uh, go to the website, check it out. It's a little different. There's something a little different about it. A little. Especially in the frontal regions yeah yeah or the, front, or the rear but uh head to two murder morons.com and check out our merch store you can see we're talking about yeah uh we got this shirt um we've got you know plenty yeah plenty of hoodies and hoodies, shirts t-shirts and you name it we got a puzzle on there there's all kinds of yeah airpod Sticker, cases yeah yeah decal something decal, whatever go get yourself something support the show and yeah and, and we we'll very much appreciate it yeah very much yes. like that's that's it feel it's so crazy if if you know, if someone that's never done this before, having like a, a public show yeah. that's out there, like when I get that little email that's like somebody just ordered a t-shirt, like that feels so freaking awesome. Yeah. And you know what, what I, mean? I just can't wait till I walk down this or go to the gas station and some lady or guy gets out of the car and they got one of our merch I don't, on. like randomly run into someone and yeah. be like, yeah, what the? Yeah. <laughs> and I just be out there and looking at it. Like, oh, that's cool. I hope they don't recognize me. <laughs> oh, you don't want to be right. Well, I don't care. Well, I don't want to get. Just, yeah. Yeah. I get it though. But it would be cool yeah. at some point to have someone be like, Andy and Mike. Yeah. Aren't you? That? I yeah. listen to you guys yeah, or I watch you guys. Grumpy ass guy. <laughs> the grumpy ass guy yeah. looks like a homeless yeah. man. Yeah. Oh man. Well, please take a moment to like, subscribe, follow us on whatever platform you uh, are listening or watching. It helps us out by pumping yep. the algorithm and getting the show out to new viewers and listeners. Yep. Um, also, like I said before, consider watching the show on YouTube or Spotify if you're listening to us. And if you're watching us and need to listen to us, we'll once again put on the screen right here. Yep. Uh, all the platforms where the audio version is available. Plus, you get to see the pictures that we're talking about. Yeah, that's that's the best yeah. part. I mean, we can't show like, we don't have like graphic, graphic stuff on there. No. But it is cool to see photos of the people we're talking about. Yeah. And locations and stuff like that. Yeah, whatever yeah. we have. Yeah. Also, we, we got to give credit where credit is due. Obviously, we did not. This is a true story. We didn't like write this or anything, uh, but we did heavily use Wikipedia. There's a great article on Gerard Schaefer. Um, I used that to research this episode and read some excerpts from it. So give Wikipedia some love. The link to that story or that Wikipedia page will be in the description. So check it out. Yep. 
Um, and besides that, next week, I'm not going to give it away, but we got another crazy, kooky, and insane story for you. Yes, we do. Might involve a uh, little old lady. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Old ladies don't want to. Come on. <laughs> yes, they do. Nah, no, they don't. <laughs> oh, man. Don't play this game with yeah. me. But come back next week, and uh, you'll get to hear that insane story. So uh, we'll see you all next Wednesday. Yep. See ya. See you. Thanks, guys.